in the real world for yourselves in the last 10 years, have you had patients who followed a perfect diet and lifestyle and died of a heart attack or had a severe stroke? Like, in other words, yes. I understand it's, you know, it's fantastic to do this and I'm going to do it, but I'm just trying to understand, like, how bulletproof are you? Is it 90 percent, 95? Are you heart attack proof completely? Like in the real world, have you had 100 patients that did this? Did you have 500? And did some of them? I mean, I know a lot of people thrive on this, but did some people die of a heart attack or have a very bad stroke while following an ideal whole food, plant-based diet, healthy lifestyle, exercise, good sleep, emotional peace? Do sometimes, it, does it happen anyway? I'd just like to understand that for heart disease and stroke. It's quite possible that it could happen. I must say that I have not seen it. As a matter of fact, when we... Uh, I wrote up uh, 198 of these patients that we've, we'd followed for close to four years. It was published in the uh, uh, Archives of Internal uh, Medicine. Uh, no, excuse me, in the, uh, <laughs> in the Journal of Family Practice. And of those 198 patients, we had uh, 62 who were not compliant. And there were uh, another 177 who were compliant. And then we... Uh, we found that in the group that were compliant, there were no major cardiac events in that in that in, entire three and a half, uh, three and three quarters years. But it was interesting that uh, when I made a comparison of our patients, that is the 177 who were compliant without any of these heart attacks, strokes, or death, I compared those to some very well known. Uh, uh, Heart cardiovascular studies such as the uh, uh, the Lyon diet heart study by Dr. Delogaril from Par uh, from France, and at the end of four years they had 25 percent heart attack, stroke, and death. Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, the Natural History of Coronary Disease, at the end of four years they had 20.3 percent heart attack, stroke, and death. Then we have Bill Bowden's <laughs> study, and at the end of uh, four years it was 19.6 percent. Then I looked at our group, and at the end of close to four years, it was one patient. And the reason we had even one patient, I have to confess, uh, this was a gentleman who should have been in the group that was non-compliant because he went to China on a vacation. He had a tendency to have hypertension. And he ate right off the economy, all the salt and all the terrible foods, and he had a small stroke, So, but I felt, I had to count him in a group that had failed because uh, if I'd said 100%, nobody would have believed us. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the point that I'm, I'm, I'm getting at is that you asked the question, uh, can you be absolutely a heart attack proof? Would, it, would, it, would that have lasted for a full 12 years? I don't know. We did an earlier study of 12 years uh, and found that indeed patients who adhered close to uh, four years, uh, again, had no further heart attack, stroke, or death. Now, it's interesting that if you look at a, can this be done collectively for a larger group? I don't know if you're familiar with the name Pekka Puska. Puska was a, a marvelous, inquisitive young physician in Helsinki who, in 1972, the province of North Karelia in Helsinki was the sort of the heart attack capital of the world. And that was such an embarrassment to Finland that Pekka Puska had been up there and he took on, not to, didn't take on, but he cooperated with the local authorities, the families, and, uh, and tried to work on, and he had quite a tussle with the dairy industry, but he got them to go closer to plant-based and he got them to stop uh, as much as he could to get them to stop smoking. And over the next 30 years from, from <laughs> 85% decrease in cardiovascular disease in Northern Karelia. And the other uh, figure that often isn't talked about, but I found very powerful in that group, during that same time period, they decreased their cancer rate by 67%. Can I ask a question of you, Dr. Esselstyn? Um, 
I'm very familiar with your work. I'm familiar with the 2014 paper that you're citing from the American Journal of um, Family Practice. In those patients that you studied, did you assess their compliance with guideline-directed medical therapy, things like aspirin and statins that we consider to be class one indications for people who do have coronary artery disease? And if so, how compliant was your patient population? Well, they were, they were I, I, would, I called each one of them individually. It took me about a year and a half. And I, I was really quite fussy in seeing how, whether they'd had any heart attack, stroke, or death. And most important of all, whether they were following the guidelines that, uh, that we had set forth. Because I will confess, I'm, I'm probably known as uh, somebody who's <laughs> a little bit strict with their, with their patients. I hate uh, failure in my patients. And I think it's so important that they are so much more willing to comply if you sh will share with them uh, the, uh, the science as we understand it. In other words, we want them to understand how they developed heart disease and most importantly, how they can become empowered as the, the locus of control to halt and to reverse their disease. And to make that happen, I confess that uh, I see about 18 or 20 patients once a month in our, uh, our uh, intensive counseling seminar. And of those 18 or 20 patients, I personally <laughs> insist on myself, uh, usually 10 days beforehand, so I can get my arms around their story and at the same time have them ask questions of me. So that coming to this five and a half hour uh, seminar, uh, we've got a strong platform. So getting back to your original question, you know, uh, have I seen people? Yeah, but you, you, the, the bias here is that I'm usually doing secondary prevention. That is, I'm, I'm seeing people uh, after an event, uh, which means that they're, they, have, they can't say that they don't have the substrate for having events. Um, but uh, the, to Dr. Sengman's point, when the people are doing guideline-directed medical therapy, they have a certain reduction in events, and it may be 26 with percent with statins and another 20% with aspirin, but that still leaves residual risk. Uh, and then when you do plant-based nutrition, no one's ever done a, 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 that I can see, a true randomized intervention, secondary prevention, it, when combined with medication, uh, and guideline-driven therapy to get the LDL less than 55. No one could have done that because the, that recommendation for 55 really came out. It came after a study, you know, done at the Cleveland Clinic. Actually, um, the the Glagoff trial showing 100% plaque regression if you used uh, evolocumab, one of the PCSK9 inhibitors, and got your LDL less than 58. Now, why they chose 55? That's another. <laughs> kind of, uh, probably uh, probably convenience to, of memory. But the bottom line is that I have not seen uh, anyone who's doing statin, aspirin, vegan diet, and an exercise program, which is my little acronym, uh, SAVE, statin, aspirin, vegan diet, exercise. Um, I have not seen one person have a cardiovascular event. Um, now, there are people, I, it's not going to be perfect because uh, there are mutants, you know, kind of we're all mutants. And if you do your 23andMe, you'll find you've got something that's a little unusual. But uh, there are so many different uh, SNPs, if, if you will, that control cholesterol or PCSK9 function or LDL receptor function. And what will happen is that you you have some people who you give that PCSK9 injection to and their LDL doesn't change. It's very rare, but it does happen. So, um, so nothing that we have in medicine is going to be 100% uh, because you do have genetic variations. And I do want to pipe up that in my experience, um, Dr. Williams, I, I can concur with you of my patients who have been compliant with a whole food plant-based diet, exercise, and guideline-directed medical therapy. I haven't had a single patient who's had progression of coronary artery disease. Right. That said, I think that the problem with the message sometimes that the plant-based community gets out is that if you go plant-based, you don't need pills. And that, that, that pills and medicines are some sort of conspiracy of big pharma. Um, 
when the truth is that what we offer in terms of lifestyle goes hand in hand with the guideline directed medical therapy of aspirins and statins and pills for blood pressure control. I know of two patients in my experience, one who is a patient of mine who had progression of coronary disease on a whole food plant-based diet, but he is a gentleman who had a familial hypercholesterolemia and was not taking his statin and was not taking his aspirin. Um, I know of one other patient in the community, not a patient of mine, who had a myocardial infarction and 10 years later required further angioplasty. He was very much an adherent of, of Dr. Russell's diet, but he was also staunchly against aspirin and statins. So the diet alone is great, but it does have to go along with the allopathic you know, guideline directed medical therapy. For, for people who are at risk, for primary prevention, maybe it could never happen, but once you have established disease, it's you, you really have to go at it with everything that you've got um, to try to uh, stem the tide of cardiovascular events. And, and, and I appreciate what you said, Dr. Shankman. I always have to point out that the other side is way bigger. <laughs> that is the leading death of cardiologists is still heart disease. And because they're not giving the nutrition recommendations as was mentioned earlier. And so you end up the number of people who are doing a statin and aspirin, but not changing their diet is much larger. And so that is our bigger problem right now. And we just have to somehow get the message out to do both. Absolutely agreed. And even as somebody who advocates a whole food plant-based diet, the majority of my patients are not people who are strictly whole food plant-based. And it's, it's a struggle every day to get them to do the exercise, to eat some vegetables, to incorporate more plant-based meals um, on their way to hopefully one day getting them to being whole food plant-based. Dr. Can Campbell. I, yeah, can I, I'd like to come back and ask you a question of Dr. Esselton uh, about your study that was very impressive. That's the study that you did. You started out with 198 patients, at least the ones that you, you recalled later. 177 stayed on board. One, right. one died. I think it was something like that. No, uh, one had a mild stroke. <laughs> yeah, actually, that fellow that died was a friend of mine. As you know, I told him to come and see you, but. I heard something later. He wasn't exactly <laughs> as he you was said. The non-compliant group, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But here, yeah, you asked this question before, but I, maybe I just missed it. I'm sorry about that. But uh, you called all your patients. I know you were very diligent. I heard you many times <laughs> talking to them. They're very, very strict, if you want to use that word, wanted to get the exact information. My question to you was, uh, do you have any data at all or any sense of the extent to which these people on your trial were using uh, some of the medications that they were advised to use? I mean, oh, yeah, were they all? Uh, uh, yes. I would say that 99% of the patients that decide to come to our seminar already have a family practitioner and they have a cardiologist because all these, pa all these patients are seriously ill with, with, uh, with heart disease. So, um, I don't know quite how to answer your what your say what your give me your question again, Colin. Well, I'm just curious if you had any more exacting information no, on the they, use, use of medications. Yeah, they, they, I I find find it's very important in the relationship that I have with these patients. I do not want to ever drive a wedge between uh, the patient and their cardiologist or their physician back at home because all these patients come if they've had heart disease they. They all come with a load of medication. I will not touch their medication. That would, uh, I don't, that would just lead to me trying to uh, handle the medication on something like 1500 patients would be, be chaos and crazy. But what does happen is I ask the patient when they go back to see their doctor two or three months, maybe after they've been to our seminar and the doctor will say, my gracious, your cholesterol has plummeted. We're going to have to really significantly reduce your cholesterol medication. And my goodness, you really, I can see, I'm glad you cut your hypertensive medication in half. Your, uh, your hypertension is really coming under control. And I notice you no longer are diabetic. But this, uh, I want the patient and their physician at home who prescribe their medications to be the one that is still monitoring their medications but the patient can be an advocate for trying to get their physician at home to, to reduce their medication. But for two different physicians to be 
ordering uh, medication on patients who were this ill would, to me is inappropriate. Mm -hmm.